Hi guys. Uh, hopefully this should follow on from uh, Elvis's last slide, uh, looking mainly at the region and how it's doing for uh, IPv6 from a CDN's point of view. We have uh, millions of eyeballs that we serve traffic to and uh, uh, differs from region. So who am I? I'm a network engineer. I'm a Formula One fan. I like to travel the world. Um, most of the time, uh, spent on interconnection and, and working on some of our uh, products. So we're uh, an AnyCast-based CDN, mainly looking for good performance, to provide security, to provide reliability, and then to analyze um, the traffic that we're serving. So anybody can use us from a very small blog to a very big government, an e-commerce site. Um, the whole spectrum is covered. Right now we have, I think we announced our 111th pop globally this week. So we have very good coverage around the world, including four pops in the Middle East, where we serve a very large percentage of the region uh, from, from deployments uh, right now all around the Gulf. Uh, I think in the Gulf right now we have four incumbent operators um, connected directly to us with uh, five million domain names available and cash locally in the market. So this is uh, mainly for performance, uh, but also for security and reliability. So as of November last year, we um, softly deployed, or in fact turned on IPv6 for all of our customers. From day one, it was available, but for the customers, it was optional. Many people had concerns about it, they were unsure, so we would allow them to use IPv4 on their website only and switch on IPv6 if they were inclined to do so. After maybe five years of, of running the CDN and, and seeing that IPv6 is easy and it works, we decided that instead of letting people slowly trickle into using it, we should push them along. So for 98% of our uh, domains, or 98% of 5 million domains, we enabled IPv6 for them. Uh, and this, this was observed. I have many friends in, in eyeball operators that said to me, have you been changing something because we see the IPv6 traffic to you going crazy. It was overnight switching on in batches hundreds of thousands of domain names to use IPv6. Um, once this happened, it's then quite easy to compare how much traffic is served on v6. Now we've switched it on. Um, simply from NetFlow data collected from devices at the edge. This obviously is based on our data, so your network might be different, but I think in most cases it's reasonably similar. Most uh, operators that use v6 will have a high usage of it immediately. So this graphic came from a blog post that we put out in, uh, in November when we announced the, um, the enablement of v6 for all the users. And this is uh, comparing IPv6 traffic and, oh, sorry, uh, traffic levels and percentage of that traffic over v6 per ASN. So if you look at, for example, on the left hand side you have many of these networks which have a very high proportion of their network is served from us to them on IPv6. I think at the top here you have some Belgians and some Taiwanese which have almost 100% of their traffic served over v6. And this is not something that's forced, it is the client choosing uh, because it has v6 enabled to be served over it. When you look further down here you have very large networks, in this case over here, China Telecom, one of the, probably the biggest in terms of number of subscribers in the world, and naturally there is uh, that much traffic on there. Then you look at some of these in the middle. These are you know, European networks or American networks that have a lot of traffic, not as much as China, but very significant proportions of traffic, but also kind of medial deployments of IPv6 on their subscribers. So for example, Sky in the UK uh, deployed IPv6 mainly last year. They are maybe the third size operator, but they are number one for IPv6 in the UK so with around say about 50% of their subscribers natively being served IPv6 traffic from our CDN. So the method was very simple. We're already collecting NetFlow data. We can already split it by uh, address family. So 
take each ASM, count how many bits per second in V4 and V6, and compare it. Repeat it for every major ASM over time and compare the data. Um, I collected this with the ugliest bash script you've ever seen, but it was so simple it worked. And stored it in Grafana, and essentially I'm done. So I looked, I tried to constrain the region to um, the GCC parts of the Levant and uh, the rest of the peninsula, just to um, kind of look from an inter interconnection point of view, most of these networks um, are served in very much the same way. They come from some of the very big pops in Europe or they're served from some of our deployments in the region. So for each, each one of these countries I picked traffic levels wise up to maybe 10 of the top networks. So starting with Bahrain, for example, there are a few operators with different market shares. But, but Telco obviously was the government operators the biggest, followed by some mobile providers um, doing various things. So there's, a, there's an even spread of this. Um, for the data, really, it, it's based on traffic levels because very small networks uh, don't operate in the same way as the very big eyeball providers. Um, and this is kind of a theme that you see. Every, every much, sorry, every ASN has pretty much the same, in fact, exactly the same zero percent. And it's not that they have a very small percent and it's rounded down. It is literally zero bits per second delivered. Same goes for Kuwait. You have operators from, from other countries. You have operators from the same country. Um, and they're all doing the same thing. Same goes for, I think in this case, most of these are providers using WiMAX or, or mobile providers, which typically in many countries you see the IPv6 adoption starting with the mobile providers. Um, in the US, this was the case with T-Mobile. They had almost complete IPv6 coverage almost immediately. Um, so in this case, there are, are five providers. In Amman, there are two providers, but the same case uh, occurs. So it's clearly not a, um, a number of operators thing. If you have a, you know, some countries you have one or two operators which will deploy um, IPv6, but the main big ones won't. In this case, the number of providers is different in each country, but they have the same zero percent. Um, Saudi Arabia was the only one so far that I could find which has any blips on a graph. So there would be, um, in these graphs here, there would be pretty much the, it's kind of hard to see, but this yellow line is IPv4, uh, and this green line down here is IPv6. So you would sometimes see, in, in this case, there is some green here. In some networks, you would see it popping around zero, and then for an hour, there would be V6, and then it would disappear again, maybe a megabit a second or something very small like that. Pretty much from all of these, um, Saudi Arabia was the only one that had any IPv6 whatsoever. And the interesting part I find from this is you look at who is doing the V6, and the number one, um, sorry, down here, is a mobile provider. And then you look at STC and there are two ASNs here. And if I'm not mistaken, one of these is, is a fixed line and one of these are mo is a mobile operator from the same company. So there's clearly some methodology in, in how uh, this is being deployed and it's usually uh, the reverse. Usually the mobile operators are the ones that are deploying IPv6 first because they already have implemented CGNAT or some kind of technology in order to enable their subscribers to essentially share address space. So those are the users that are already in need of um, uh, native connectivity. Um, I guess maybe there's some other reasons, maybe somebody knows uh, why this, this is the case, but it's fascinating to see. Um, so here is, is where I saw a blip. There was a, a, a period of the day where something would be, maybe it's an enterprise customer that they're testing with, maybe it's a test bed or something, but there would be a blip during the day where there would be the regular subscribers doing IPv4 uh, completely. And then there would be this tiny little blip of V6 space that pops up sometime in the day for a couple of hours and then it disappears. 
I don't know if it's related to the hours that people are in the office or the hours that people are doing something specific, but these, these blips are fascinating because you can clearly see where there is, is something going on, but it's not taking hold. So if we move to some of the other places like Iraq, the, the same thing happens. There's, there are many operators with different market shares, but they're all pretty much doing the same thing. Again, there is a blip here. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure who this network is, but reading from the name, I wouldn't be surprised if there is some kind of uh, long distance connectivity, connectivity that's being provided here. So maybe there's a test bed or something, but it's, it's again very small. Jordan is the same. Lebanon, in this case, uh, has an, an interesting um, an issue that I've experienced personally when, when working on trying to find a way to enter the market is all of these networks here are all homed behind the one government-owned operator. So all of these guys have tested and tried as, as best they can to deploy IPv6 connectivity, but there's only one way out of the country. And this is hindering the growth of, of IPv6 in the country because there's simply no way for these networks to connect to the rest of the world uh, without this connectivity. Um, I know for a, for a fact from some friends of mine that we're actually providing V6 connectivity to Lebanon over IPv4 tunnels. Um, kind of a horrible way to, to implement it, but it's a good start, at least when the operator that is providing the international connectivity is, is making it more difficult um, for these providers to actually move forward. I think this is a good example of where uh, kind of not necessarily government regulation, but the, the government operator digging its heels in and not deploying something is slowing down the rest of the market. So Palestine is pretty much the same. In this case, I think this is uh, interesting because if I'm not mistaken, there uh, are different operators in different territories, but they all behave in the same way and they all have the same kind of problems. Um, the, you know, none, none of these are different. This, the Syrians have uh, one telecom operator, so they have one network that needs to deploy it, and then essentially they can have 100% coverage completed. The, um, the same thing is happening here with, with what must be testing. Um, I believe this is a mobile operator. I mean, it's called Aransel, so it must be. Some of these are all um, diff different types of providers, some uh, residential, some mobile. However, they're all homed behind one international operator, same as Lebanon, that doesn't have V6. Um, again, Yemen, one operator, same thing. So why does nobody use IPv6? This is clearly a trend. Um, an interesting fact that I heard from somebody is the, the filtering systems that are, that are implemented either don't work, from, uh, don't work with IPv6 or they don't work well with IPv6. Um, so a, a colleague of mine told me that, that in, in one country they had implemented these, these filtering systems um, many years ago and they were testing IPv6 and the technical deployment was fantastic and then they deployed it and realized that none of the v6 traffic was being filtered. It was going unfiltered for a while. And then, oh no, you know, this traffic is unfiltered. We have to turn this off immediately. And you see the graphs for this, and you know, there's a very nice, healthy growth. And then one day it suddenly shuts off, the traffic disappears, and it goes back uh, into the past. Clearly, lack of education is a problem. You come to all of these uh, uh, kind of meetings, and people have uh, workshops on IPv6. They have talks about how you, know, you need to deploy it, talks about uh, how people are buying v4 space because they're trying to put off implementing v6. Um, I think this is part of the problem. I don't think it's a major contributor to the problem because it's clearly in some regions um, deployed and deployed strongly. I think it must be the market factors that, that control this and obviously like, like many people have said, buying address space or deploying you know, v6 sorry, CGNAT is, is, is stopping people deploying V6 because it's something else that they have to learn so if they can put something in place to, to stop this then it makes eh, easier, I'm not sure, but they don't have to learn something new. So if you compare this with other countries or other regions in fact, our top 10 networks based on amount of traffic V6 is, is pretty much skewed towards either uh, Europe or the US um, with the exception of India has one new mobile operator which has 
very high levels of, uh, of V6 traffic. In this case, it shows up on the graph not necessarily because um, it has a very high proportion, but it had an incredibly high uptake in, in users, and they natively deployed V6 to a proportion of those users, so naturally that brings a lot of V6 traffic. There may be some operators which uh, were on the, the slide earlier with um, all of the networks that have almost 100%, but they're very small networks, so they don't necessarily show up in, in some of the statistics. What's interesting from here is three of them are mobile only, which is uh, usually where it gets deployed most. Um, I think particularly from the US, there were at least two operators which may have been mobile only operators. Um, I know the UK one is, is a, a residential only, and maybe one from Germany is residential only as well with the US. Um, one of these, in fact, is a content-only networks from the US. So this is um, interesting because this is not an eyeball. This is a network which um, is, is cr essentially crawling our CDN for content, and this is almost 100% V6 traffic. Um, some of these are a mix. In, in Germany, for example, the incumbent operator operates a, uh, a fixed line network and a mobile network, and it is very high levels of, uh, of V6 implemented. So like I said, uh, before. Some of these make the list because they have a very high percentage of V6 of their traffic. Some of them have very high levels of V6, but it's a small percentage because their network is huge, and some of them have both high levels of traffic and high percentage. The one from the UK is a good example of that. They have a lot of traffic served, but also a high percentage of it. So I talked to Hisham while I was uh, writing this presentation, and he said uh, what would be interesting would be what percentage of our CDN traffic is V6 when you look globally. And this is about, when I looked at the time of day, it was about 8%. And that's when I'm sitting in London in European time, it's you know hovering below 10%. When the US wakes up, this spikes up because of the, the very high uh, implementation in the US region. So I thought this was very interesting. I left it overnight and woke up the next day and found it exactly 2 o'clock in the morning, every day the, the the US traffic spikes and the V6 traffic goes up. And as the US goes to sleep, it, it dips down again. So I kind of questioned if this data was reliable, and I looked at Jeff Tucson's data and kind of compared, and it, it seemed pretty much the same. There was a very nice um, a graph, which I think we saw on Elvis' slide, which had uh, country split up, also regional split up, and the whole of the Gulf region was pretty much red. There was almost n nothing anywhere. Um, I only measured the biggest ASNs for each country, based on traffic levels, based on our data, but it's pretty much representative of uh, what I think others will see. And the numbers obviously will be different for different types of networks. If you have uh, mainly content, you will see probably more V6 if you enable it than maybe peer-to-peer -peer traffic or, or some other kind of uh, maybe voice or video traffic. What's interesting with this is this is not necessarily a turn on V6 and it comes um, comes with turning on the traffic comes, you have to actually make sure that your V6 is, is performant at, at the very least the same as V4. So I did some very basic tests um, from a home connection uh, in the UK with, with native V4 and native V6 connectivity and there was no difference whatsoever. So clearly V6 is not a performance strategy. Um, I mean they're, they're very basic tests but it's normal usage that de determines um, the performance of these, these technologies. So I looked at Jeff Houston's um, in-depth commentary on, on some of his measurements and he found pretty much that V4 and V6 is roughly equivalent. The performance doesn't necessarily change. What was interesting that he found was on, on V4 connectivity is uh, more reliable. Connections open uh, in a very higher percentage of the time than V6. Uh, I can't say why this is, but I can only imagine that it is because V4 has been implemented for so many years, it's become more reliable. So uh, in the future, I would expect V6 will become more reliable as more people understand it and implement it. I also found online a guy called Chris Donnelly found, uh, again, some, some things are better on V4, some are better on V6. In reality, consumer devices have no real difference. So when you see people saying happy eyeballs will cause V6 traffic to go crazy. I don't think this is true. I think probably the provider's uh, routing policies will determine which is faster because maybe they will route a different way for V4 and V6, which I don't really understand. 
But th this does happen. You see providers with a V4 policy that goes one way and a V6 policy that goes in completely the opposite direction. Um, depending on how you implement your V4 also, obviously CGNAT can have an effect. If you have huge state tables with uh, translations, then you can put some, um, some strain on this. I know from some friends that tested some consumer NAT devices that they had a, a limit of how much bandwidth that they could, they could translate, and above that it was impossible to, to get any more. Uh, interestingly, some applications even put a penalty on V4. I think this is not necessarily because V6 is more performant, but they want to push people towards V6. Um, different mindsets on whether this is good or bad, but this happens and it's done by big software vendors, so you know, it is what it is. What's interesting from our point of view is we, we are a CDN, but we are also very much a DDoS protection provider. So when you see attacks coming in, they come in on IPv4 space from countries that have very high levels of CG NAT implemented. So essentially any mitigation you put in place is going to affect potentially thousands of people. So by deploying IPv6, you kind of limit the, um, the collateral damage that any mitigation can cause if you put some rate limits on on a slash 32 and v4 space, you might affect a thousand users. In, in v6, you will affect, in fact, probably one device in one person's house. So if they have a rogue fridge with uh, an internet connection that is DDoSing a website, the fridge might be affected, but who cares about that? Their iPhone and their laptop and whatever other device they have is not going to be affected by this. Um, everybody knows that it, it, it lowers costs. The more v6 that you implement, the less you rely on v4. I don't have to tell you that impact. Often, as I mentioned with the filtering systems, tools don't necessarily support IPv6. I've seen many um, filtering systems, content management systems, IPAM databases, all kinds of systems that don't support v6. Whether that's because they're an old tool or people are digging their heels in, I don't know. But this is a, obviously a very real concern. Many times I've seen people do presentations at conferences that say we tried to deploy v6 only in our network and we found that this strange PDU somewhere that only has access on v4 lost access to the device when we turned v4 off. Um, what's interesting with uh, with our setup is uh, we use Anycast outside to attract traffic into a, a data center and then inside that we use um, the same Anycast to split it across many servers with ECMP. And this can affect, because IPv6 doesn't allow fragmented packets, um, you have to use PMTUD to discover the, uh, the maximum size of packets you can send across and when you have ECMP, the, the TCP session is not open. So we have to uh, broadcast those ICMP packets inside the data center between every machine in order to respond from the machine that the connection, the connection was established to. Um, interestingly, also lack of NAT can expose hosts. People use NAT as a security mechanism and they say, oh, I don't need a firewall because I have NAT and all my devices are, have a different address. You can't reach them. Well, on v6, there's no NAT or no sane person um, deploys NAT. So briefly, I looked at some of the Atlas probes to, to try and confirm how many of these devices. And I, what I found interesting was some of these networks, like I said, have no v6 available, especially like Lebanon, have, have native v6 on the probes. So it's clearly there. It's just not deployed. Um, in summary, v6 is absolutely necessary. You must deploy it. At some point in, in, in the world, you know, you're going to be in a situation where it's required. And we already see this with some uh, origin servers only available on IPv6. So there is a, a separation happening. It brings more benefits and it brings drawbacks. Essentially, nothing bad will happen if you deploy v6. It can only bring good things. Um, it's clearly in production in the Middle East and people have been testing it, as I've seen with the blips, but it doesn't, it doesn't get pushed out with enough priority to the users. Um, I think part of this is because it won't bring you a return on investment, but it will help cut down costs and if your costs are lower, in a way that is a return on investment because you don't have to pay so much for your IPv4 space or any CG net equipment or anything like that. And 
Finally, make sure your tools are compatible with v6. This is probably the number one reason that people don't deploy it is the lack of co uh, compatibility. Um, as I've said, deploy it as default, deploy it to your users, and things are improving, so don't stop now. Finally, um, I totally forgot to bring some probes with me, but there are people around from, from right which will give you an Atlas probe if you, if you don't have one. Uh, and this is very helpful to measure the V6 connectivity in the, in the region. Uh, any questions? Yes, Jan, please, go ahead. Check now, check now. Don't, don't touch anything, yes. Yes, now it works, okay. Um, Jan George. Um, in there, you were wondering in your presentation why the IPv4 and IPv6 routing is different. I had the same question basically for years now. I, I went around the world, I, I spoke to many operators why they're doing that, and the generic answer I got was well, we have a massive amount of IPv4 traffic that we need to, to shift around our uplinks. You know, IPv6 traffic is so small that it doesn't matter where it goes. And this makes me sad a little bit. Um, not, not because if they are shifting traffic around, uh, the, the IPv4 traffic around the, the, the uplinks, it, it, they make it worse because it's not, it's not the optimal way of shipping the traffic. But it makes me a little bit sad because people is not equalizing the peering agreements on IPv4 and IPv6. And I, I, think, I think we should we should send a very strong message. If you deploy IPv6, please make sure that you do the same peering uh, with the same people on IPv4 and IPv6. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. So what was interesting is I talked to one of the providers in the region that we that deployed a, a, a cache node with, and I said, uh, you're sending v4 traffic to, to Europe to reach the origins, and for v6 traffic, you send all of it to Singto and Singapore. Why is this? You have peering already with this large backbone network that's storing the content, and they said, oh, we need to do optimization on that, and we haven't done v6 optimization. So when we do that, oh, it'll be great. And I checked again a year later, and oh, look, it's not changed. It's ridiculous. Uh, so I have a comment with regards to filtering. So you mentioned that is fil oh, so my, my name is Osama Dosri. I'm um, part of the Menog program committee. I also work for VMware. Uh, you have made a comment with regards to filtering. So filtering, uh, to my understanding, is, uh, is, not, is not the reason for IPv6 uh, lack of adoption. Mm -hmm. um, at least uh, several countries and providers uh, in the region. So I know, for example, for a fact that wire filter, which is one of the more popular ones that is used, is, is a IPv6 native for, since adoption, which is like four or five years ago. Thank you. Last question from the yeah. audience, yes, please. Um, my name is Maher Kasim. I'm from Lebanon Moscow Group, ISP. Um, th there were some interesting numbers in your presentation, and um, I saw the spikes in IPv6 traffic, which were also interesting. And I was wondering, if, from the point of view of your CDN, if you have some insight into how much actual mobile traffic there was versus laptop and desktop and server traffic. Like, do you have any numbers on, on those uh, types of statistics? So I can look um, in my data, uh, an ASN data, because it's all from NetFlow, so I can see how much an ASN has. Um, I think some of my colleagues have, have that kind of information, so it's possible to, to reach it, so I can talk to you afterwards. But it's, it's looking at the, some of these, um, when I go back to the, the top 10 list here, um, from globally, uh, uh, where is it? Here. So one of these networks is uh, providing both uh, residential connections and mobile connections. As far as I can see, they're all on the same ASM, but the address pools that they are using have in the reverse DNS some hints to, to what the devices are, and it's, it's, it's evenly spread out across all of them. Um, some of them, in, in the case of uh, India, it's a mobile provider. They have no landline. It's you know, it's, you must have heard of, of, uh, of this network, but they've essentially grown their traffic hundreds of percent month on month, and it's all mobile. So there's, there's a fairly even spread across 
both mobile operators and home operators. In the US with Comcast, they, they're, a, they're a home operator only, but they have very high levels of V6. Okay, quick one from you, please. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? This is uh, Michal from uh, Till Yemen, Yemen. Actually, back to your slides uh, that you have mentioned, Yemen, that with uh, one operator, um, I just would like to add there are uh, five operators in Yemen with five ASNs. Mm -hmm. Two ASN only been uh, published, but in your slide you are only mentioning. Uh, so, so as I mentioned in uh, here is my data is based on traffic levels. Uh, sorry? My, my data is based on the level of traffic to an ASN. So what I did is I looked from our net flow how much we serve to the country and then how much we serve to each ASN. And in some countries like um, Iran, there are many ASNs where we have you know, 10, 20, 30 percent of traffic to an ASN from the country, but it's not almost 100 percent. Whereas with Yemen, it's almost 100 percent of our traffic to the country is served to that ASN. So whether there's an incumbent provider or a very high majority sh holder okay. of the market, that's where all of our traffic goes. It is based on your traffic that uh, yes. being served to the country. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. So if there is a smaller operator that's like 1% of the market, they might have 100% V6, but it, it might have been skipped because it's like 5 megabits or something. It depends how yeah. traffic is yeah. close to the country. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, the Martin, for the great presentation. Um, thank you. <laughs>